so much that happens in that first year, but I think if you boil it down, the first year in so many ways for both student and institution is about belongingness, about creating a sense of connection, um, about agency, about creating a community of individuals. You know, it used to be that that by the first six weeks, we, the goal was that a student knew a staff member, a peer, you know, and on a faculty member. And, and you know, I, I think those timelines have been blown out of the water, not just by COVID, but by many things. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that sort of um, compartmentalized and who they need to know, but just feeling like they belong, like they know where to go. Welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I am your host, Heather Shea. Today, we are discussing the unique cohorts currently on college and university campuses, and specifically the unique experiences facing a group some are calling Froshmores. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope you'll find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the profession. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find us at studentaffairsnow.com, on YouTube, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Today's episode is sponsored by EverFi, the trusted partner for 1,500 colleges and universities. EverFi is the standard of care for student safety, well-being, and with the results to prove it. Today's episode is also sponsored by Anthology. Learn more about their innovative data-driven platforms to build and foster your student engagement experiences. Learn more by visiting anthology.com engage. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Heather Shea. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am broadcasting live from East Lansing, Michigan, near the campus, or on the campus, actually today, I'm in my office of Michigan State University where I serve as the Director of Women's Student Services and Interim Director of the Gender and Sexuality Campus Center. I am also an affiliate faculty member in the MSU Student Affairs Administration Program. Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. The university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. I am so thrilled to have an uh, extremely uh, wise and generative panel today. Thank you all three of you for joining me um, to share a little bit about your background and experiences and specifically addressing the needs of the unique groups of students we have on campus today. Um, so as each of you go around and introduce yourselves, um, tell us a little bit about you, your current role, your pathway into um, student affairs, the work you do. And um, I'm going to start with uh, Jennifer. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks, Heather. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, wonderful to be with the other panelists here. My name is Jennifer Coip. I'm the executive director of the National Resource Center for the First Year Experience in Students in Transition. And even though we're completely externally facing and serve a national and international constituency, we are located at the University of South Carolina, which is on the historic lands of the Cherokee and Congaree people, and I want to acknowledge was built with enslaved laborers. Um, and so I do want to acknowledge the history there so that we can you know, learn from it and do better to one, for one another and to one another. Um, again, the National Resource Center is located at the university, but serves a national international constituency. We have um, professional development events, publications, original research, and all sorts of communication venues. And hopefully many of you have had a chance to interact with us. Uh, in terms of like, you know, where, where my pathway has gone, I have always lived in those liminal spaces of higher education that are between student affairs and academic affairs, that somebody sneezes and they take over and it suddenly is reporting to somebody different. And those tend to be things like, you know, first year experience, student success initiatives, assessment, um, things that almost sort of supersede any one categorization. And I've loved living in those spaces. They've allowed me um, to spend my career, you know, as sort of bilingual and cross-cultural from a higher education perspective. And I feel like there's been great value and I've enjoyed contributing to this idea of building bridges and creating connections on campuses, which, you know, we'll, hopefully we'll get to later as a, as a fundamental practice in the work of serving first year students and other students in transitions. Um, on a personal level, I have to say I've done action research on this topic. I dropped off my older son to college when uh, <laughs> fall of 2019 and picked him up in spring 
spring break of 2020, and he did not go back for quite some time. Uh, he is now a junior and doing well, but I, I lived with an N of one research project with this in my home. And so I feel on so many levels, um, the importance of these students, not just in abstraction or as research or as individuals are serving on a campus, but as one of my own children. That's fantastic personal experience. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for being here today. Uh, Laura, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Randolph. I serve as the director uh, for New Student Orientation and Family Programs at Rutgers University, uh, where we're really looking at student transitions. And so not just um, getting them through orientation, but really helping them through kind of that fall, uh, spring, and um, kind of moving in and moving through and moving on experience. Um, and so for me, um, my higher ed journey um, has been uh, starting out in residence life. And so seeing students at kind of all, all walks of their, their college experience um, and living learning communities, uh, but always gravitating towards that first year. And so uh, really thinking through how are we welcoming folks into the university environment and what support structures are we putting in place for them to be successful. Um, so I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation as we think about the multiple uh, populations that are um, coming back in some cases or for the first time coming to a college campus. Thank you so much for being here, Laura. I appreciate it. Um, Brian, welcome. Thanks, Heather. Uh, my name is Brian McDonald. Uh, I I'm the Executive Director of Communications and Organizational Development for UCLA Student Affairs. Uh, I started the, uh, the, the pandemic in residential life, however, and, you know, professionally, I've, I've bounced around geographically and in terms of functional area. So residential life, first year experience, uh, uh, orientation, and through all of those uh, opportunities, uh, I think for me, how I've approached our work is, you know, thinking about those students who uh, we don't see every day, thinking about how we put unlikely ideas together to create new opportunities. And certainly that has been a perpetual challenge over these past two years. And so uh, I also have a unique perspective that I'm sitting out this quarter. Uh, I'm on uh, paternity leave with a two month old baby at home. So I've been able to take stock of what's going on, not just at UCLA, but nationally. And I think what's very interesting to me as we have this conversation is how dynamically different uh, our experiences and our answers may be based on where we are uh, in the country, whether we're at uh, the politics of our states or if we are at a university that is surging with enrollment or suffering from enrollment. Uh, and so I think as we approach some of these challenges and opportunities, uh, we're not going to have a one size fits all solution. And so uh, I think we're going to have hopefully frameworks for great conversations uh, and an ability to think differently. So thank you so much, Heather. And I appreciate getting to connect with awesome colleagues. So thank you. Yes, I should say welcome back, Brian, because you were on a previous episode about geek culture, one of our very first episodes. So thank you for joining us back here again on Student Affairs. Yeah, happy to. I'll try that not to swerve one. too much into nerd stuff. Promise. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really fun episode. Um, so I know this is a massive question. Uh, so, but I, Jennifer, I really want to pick your brain for a moment here about what we know um, about these periods of transition. You know, and and I will also say that the all four of us are are at pretty traditional four year institutions. Um, so we are sp speaking about a specific student experience. And we are gonna get into a little bit later some variations on that. Um, but what do we know about periods of transition when students come to campus for their first year of college and what are their needs? Um, and anything you'd like to share about that, go. <laughs> Yeah, that's like five decades of research and practice. So I'll do my best <laughs> and to honor, you know, the my the you know individuals who are groundbreakers in this whole thing. One of the things I think I key into a little bit is the idea of traditional, right? Because I don't know that that mm -hmm. exists anymore. We certainly are on four-year campuses, but traditional, I think, is such an. A, a, one of the most exciting things I heard was somebody talk about new traditional students, not non-traditional students, because it really flipped the framework and to me was very meaningful. And I think there's also a lot of um, that is breaking in the ground or breaking from the idea of traditional thoughts around transitions. So historic, very good at the time, um, theory was really about transitions, was really about endings and beginnings, very concrete kind of you're, you're leaving this phase, going to this phase. And there's some element of that, but I think 
the transition literature now is much more about you know honoring the whole students and the identities and experiences they bring with them to college. I think at one point there was a lot of talk about how this is their first major transition or the first time they left home and I you know we clearly cannot make that distinction anymore. Students have a host of experiences before they come to us and may not be of traditional age, may be in different spaces in their lives where this isn't the first time, this isn't the first transition. Um, so I think that you know, now we're looking much more about things, not necessarily being additive, but more, more about expansion and amplification of self and identities and learning um, and transformation rather than just kind of tran like transition. Um, and I like that. So I, I do want to sort of say that I think there's just been sort of this theoretical and conceptual shift in how we talk about the first year experience on the transitions away from these traditional ideas. Um, you know, to a, to honor a host of student identities who are coming to us, a host of cultural, you know, um, foundations, and as well as just kind of, you know, a difference in pathways. And that's exciting. Um, now, none of that is to minimize the fact that the nature of transition in higher education is significant. It represents a courageous milestone that is about reconceptualizing a future, both for the students, but often for their families and their communities. Um, you know, what we know about the uplift of higher education with respect to learning, employability, personal development, civic engagement, community involvement, global citizenry, you know, health and well-being, you know, social justice, all of that really does speak that, that this is a monumental milestone. It just may not be how we've traditionally conceptualized it as closing one door and walking through a hallway to a different one. Um, it's, it's really taking who the student was and, and that identity with them and amplifying it. Um, in many ways, the first year is fundamental, fundamental to setting a precedent and a foundation for success in college and for all the opportunities it opens up for individual and community. Um, the, the, you know, there's so much that happens in that first year, but I think if you boil it down, the first year in so many ways for both student and institution is about belongingness, about creating a sense of connection, um, about agency, about creating a community of individuals. You know, it used to be that that by the first six weeks, we, the goal was that a student knew a staff member, a peer, you know, and on a faculty member. And and you know, I, I think those timelines have been blown out of the water, not just by COVID, but by many things. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that sort of um, compartmentalized and who they need to know, but just feeling like they belong, like they know where to go. Um, you know, the the our environments they understand for skill development. Um, there's a pathway for academic success and I know what that looks like for themselves. That first year is really about kind of operationalizing all of those elements and understanding who they are within that environment, usually institutionally, but just also within a community of practice. What does it mean to be starting in a new community of practice that represents higher education and all the things therein? Um, so the first year is really about finding footing in that institutional environment. And a lot of that has to do with that sense of safety and connection. Um, and in many ways, I think that's why we're here because so much of that was interrupted by COVID, mm. right? Yeah. And I think though that COVID really also though showed us some ways that higher education writ large and you know, first year experience professionals had been using sense of place as a crutch or shield for community and belongingness and sense of purpose. You know, what, what are we trying to achieve? You know, we all do this where we bring new students onto campus and we parade them around the, the quad or take them to a, a very iconic sports facility or to the brand new recreational facility or pool and, and pretend that that is communicating purpose or mm -hmm. uh, what the community means. Um, and so in some ways, the literature that I've read about COVID, which is still very nascent, um, certainly not conclusive, is that the institutions that had a much better sense programmatically and, and organizationally of purpose around what does it mean to be at this institution? What does it mean to be a part of our community? What are the expectations and obligations um, that one has as being a part of this organization you know, as a new member, um, as, a, as a first year student? fared better than those that maybe had been relying on place as they crutch for really articulating a sense of purpose. And so that first year is really about connecting to the purpose of the institution, what you're there about. Um, and, that, and that's exciting. And we see a lot of, of you know, best, better, promising, whatever word, sure. you know, adjective you want to use, pr practices, you know, some that have been around for decades, like the first year seminar, other ones that are redefining themselves as being first year specific, like academic advising, our orientation colleagues and housing colleagues, critical and fundamental to that. And then we also see new partners like librarians and individuals in financial aid that are making themselves um, 
critical partners to us in a student development puzzle, not just transactional services. So there's a lot of movement going on there. Um, now, maybe to get into to the lane of some later questions, I do also want to talk about the second year because I think, you know, the sophomore year over the past 15 to 20 years has taken its own identity. You know, that we had the first year experience and then the sophomore year experience came up. And it is serving a different set of needs of the student in that pipeline. I think for a long time, people, there was pushback of, well, you're just, you know, you're moving the cliff, you know? And it's like, well, no, we, if you do development right, there are different developmental challenges at different phases. And to be honest, first year professionals are trying to cram an awful lot into that first year that may or may not have been appropriate. And so the second year we see a lot with respect to students after they find that sense of safety and connection, hopefully doing a lot more examination of, of purpose in themselves. Like, what am I doing here? What do I want to do with the world? Where, what is my epistemological center? How do I live and learn in the world? Is that appropriate to the major that I thought I wanted? Is that appropriate to the career when I want to make a contribution? Um, and we see a lot more sort of exploration of personal identity areas, interrogation of, of those kind of externally defined pieces of our identity, of students' identity. Um, and how does that fit into the trajectory academically and career-wise um, as well? So that second year is a lot of questioning. And I think, again, right now we find that students might be coming in without that foundation of safety and, and sense of place in that mm -hmm. first year because they may not have been there or maybe sort of questioning their, their connection to the community when it was done remotely and yet still facing these challenges which are going to show up in the second year irrespective of what that first year was, right? That the timeline may be slightly delayed but it's not exactly pushed off a whole other year just because you weren't on campus last year. So I don't know that I answered your question. I might've created a whole new portal of ideas for us to explore. I love it. I love it. Well, I like how you queued up this idea of this like really transformed experience that um, our current cohorts are, are are having on campus. So um, I think we move really into this idea of uh, the term that Rutgers uh, coined in the article that we're, we're borrowing and, and uh, uh, going to explore more today, which is this idea of this um, cohort of students who were first year students during pandemic, per perhaps learning from home. Um, spent a year doing that, and now they're sophomores on our campuses. I have one who works in my office in Women's Student Services, so I don't know if Ashley is watching today, but I keep thinking about her because um, when she comes in, it's like everything is brand new, and I keep forgetting that last year, even though she was working for us last year as well, um, she wasn't here on campus. She was living at her house in Ann Arbor, and so what is it like um, what do we what do we what do we mean by froshmores? Um, so Laura, can you talk a little bit about that group um, of of sophomores as well as you know some of the things that Jennifer talked about regarding this first year group as well and how together they are making up this really interesting cohort of students. Oh, absolutely. Um, I love the Froshmore um, kind of title. Uh, I would love to take credit for that. Uh, but our parent and family community actually are the ones that kind of coined that phrase. But I think it, it's a good descriptor of um, particularly our second year students, um, because what you have said, they have experienced college, um, but not in that place, um, kind of sense of place uh, uh, context. Um, and so it's trying to kind of give respect to you, you've been in college, you've been taking the classes, you've been interacting with faculty, maybe interacting with students, but there's a, a campus comp uh, component and particularly at Rutgers, we are a very uh, complex campus and it's a huge part of the Rutgers experience. And so how do you create space um, for that exploration to happen? And at the same time, our first year students. Um, and so for our first year students, I imagine um, kind of across the country, many of them are stepping foot on campus for the first time at move-in. Um, so there's not even an open house experience, or if it is, it's more of a virtual experience. And so they're trying to imagine um, what living on campus or sharing a room or those traditions spots on campus uh, can look like and kind of what's that connection to self. Um, and so it, it, I, I think we're in this unique space of how do you pull back the curtain on what's important, uh, what's, what do you highlight? How do you make them feel a part of the community? And I think in particular with our, our, our freshman population, um, how do you still acknowledge the, the learning that has taken place? Um, the learning, whether it be in the classroom, um, about the, the university, in our case, about Rutgers, uh, but also add on that layer. Because for this population, it's that question of you don't know what you don't know. Uh, and so how do you create that space to uh, kind of drop some teasers here and there 
Um, how do you create maybe a kind of a checklist for them to know, hey, at this point in the semester, here are some things that you should be uh, um, considering. And so it's an interesting population and in right now, I think we're seeing a lot of merging of the two in terms of our first year students and our second year students, but also trying to find some uh, unique um, kind of identifiers and ways to support. Um, I, I think as we look at our welcome program, um, students were excited to be on campus. Uh, they were excited to go to events, to be in spaces, um, uh, with other people that were not boxes on screens. Um, they were excited just to get out and explore. Uh, and so from kind of the, the program in me, that was exciting. Um, but now as we are kind of get into the thick of things, we're also seeing in terms of balance. Um, how are you balancing now being immersed in this campus experience? Um, the classwork hasn't lessened. In many ways, it might've increased um, in uh, being able to navigate all of those different pieces. And so uh, it's exciting time. Um, but it's also just trying to really understand who our students are. Um, I think from the research aspect, um, there's a lot of pieces that we're seeing um, that fit into the research in terms of, um, we know that this no longer is kind of that first monumental experience in terms of um, being away from home for the first time, or uh, perhaps even engaging in conversations uh, with people who are different from them. But how do you balance that with still wanting to create these experiences where they are challenged, where they can step outside of their box, um, where they can try something new, something different, um, but also in a kind of measured ways. Uh, so that's a lot I recognize, uh, but it, it is something that I, I think we'll, we're gonna be uh, kind of working through and trying to understand, uh, particularly with our second year students, um, are they now in a trend um, and sometimes behaviorally as our first year students? Will there be kind of a, uh, a shift where they now kind of fit in a second year lane? I don't necessarily want to call it necessarily a lane, but just thinking about right now, there's some trends that we're seeing that are similar in terms of uh, for us being on campus. Um, so now you're testing those limits, those boundaries. Um, you are uh, starting to uh, explore campus. You're starting to see who your support networks are. And those are very similar traits to what our, our first year students um, are, are experiencing and, and are demonstrating. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it's interesting, it's exciting. Um, and I think the impetus for the article was really just starting conversations um, of we recognize these students have not been on campus. How do we welcome them into the community? It's not acknowledging what you have lost, but wanting to acknowledge what you have done, what you have been able to accomplish, um, but recognizing the campus community piece is the piece that we wanna make sure that we can welcome you into. I love that. And I think we will definitely put the link to the article in our show notes. So you can go to our website and find that. Cause it did, I think for me, at least it highlighted this kind of making up for lost time and maybe what they didn't get their first year. And I've kind of seen that a little bit on our campus as well. Um, so Brian, you transitioned in the middle, but you were working over in housing before, and you definitely experienced housing in the middle of the initial parts of COVID. Um, so I want to kind of pick your brain a little on not only the implications for those residential experiences, but also in your new role with communications, like that's uh, also a really key component to this because the students aren't physically on campus receiving orientation information, they're receiving it mm -hmm. through other media. Uh, you know, how do you cycle that through, make sure they're getting the messages that they need? So whole lot of um, kind of your areas of expertise uh, to share a little bit with our audience. Yeah, and, and I don't know if I, I can consider it expertise. I feel like we just hit a, a reset button, right? And we're all learning, but you know, Jennifer yeah. and Laura, as you were you're talking and sharing so much, you know, great observations. I also just think about all the mistakes I made when I was 16, 17, and 18 in front of other people that probably didn't get made by some of these students, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just college student development, it's high school development. I, I, I'm on paternity mm -hmm. leave now, but I, I was on campus quite a bit during move in and I was in an elevator with, you know, four socially distant uh, uh, young men and they had no ability to regulate their cologne use. It was like uh, <laughs> baby, baby snakes who couldn't control their venom. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that would have been me, uh, you know, in, in, 19, in uh, 1996. Uh, but I, I think as we talk to our staff too, there's, there's some things that, you know, folks didn't quite experience in terms of um, mistake making, especially mm -hmm. socially and probably academically, um, that are being made now. Uh, and I also think too, the UC system, we're also, 
Uh, you know, if we didn't have a pandemic, we'd be looking at how the lack of an SAT for the incoming class uh, would be impacting. So there's so many different things, which is why I think, um, Jennifer, I think you mentioned we're just starting to crack into all of the different research we'll be doing on these folks. But it, it is true. I, I started the pandemic in residential life. Uh, and now I'm uh, executive director of communications and organizational development and, you know, working closely with our housing partners during this whole thing at, at UCLA, 98% of our first years uh, live on campus. So the demand to be one of those 20,000 who live on, uh, it was a very attentive audience because our demand was so high. Uh, and so that was a place where we could prioritize messaging, which is why I think you're spot on, Heather. Uh, how do we actually find the places where folks are listening? And, and prioritize it. And I think the specific role of living on campus, just to you know, stay on this for a second, it provides a home base. And I think where admissions and orientations and summer experiences did an admirable job over the past two years trying to replicate things to specifically virtual environments, uh, there, there's definitely an absence of that in person for many folks that I think was felt. And so I, I think of all the things we may convert to digital, the importance of sequential in-person when possible engagement is important. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who during, you know, if you had campus closures, but you were walking campus and you ran into uh, a parent or a student or someone walking around with their phone and you just interjected and said, hey, you, and they just were so happy to talk to another human being who worked at the university, even though there's well curated messages and media online that is so much better than what I could offer them that made a huge difference. And I think that we have to really look at those types of things that maybe we didn't do, saved us some money, but we have to make sure that we at least uh, reflect on what took place. Um, so I think there's a sequential unpacking happening in our halls and apartments now that is scaled back. And uh, things that we used to be really great at in October, are just gonna have to happen in January for our, our staff. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs to be okay. Uh, I think just getting through the doors for move in uh, and just understanding COVID protocols was so much. Um, and so now getting to some of those developmental things that we really prioritized, I think folks are now starting to, and we're in the quarter system. So we're probably a little bit behind where some of y'all's students are at. Uh, we opened, we moved in in late September. Right, so we're still in, you know, first round of, you know, the midterms and, and things like that. But as far as effective communications go, things change so quickly leading up to all mm -hmm. of our openings that sometimes, you know, over the past 18 months, campus has shared information with constituents that was news to staff or it contradicted public health ordinances or communication got messy with students and, and they, they turned to those who they had trusting relationships with. And in the absence of those connections, who do you trust? Maybe student leaders, maybe active social media accounts, maybe friends. And sometimes those, those sources are spot on, sometimes they're not, but they're fast and responsive. And so I think universities needed to learn how to be accurate and fast and not taking a week to read a draft. I'm sure many of you read drafts of emails that were going to go out and you know, draft 32 and okay, did, are we still talking about the same thing we were a couple of days ago? So I think universities needed to learn how to be more fast and accurate and students needed to learn how to continue to read email, right? And to continue to stay on top of it and to roll with the punches. And so I think uh, those things, those things occurred. And, and I also think uh, our communications needed to be inclusive and they needed to still maintain that core tenant of student affairs work in terms of being point A to point B, Many of us became very well versed in COVID protocols and health ordinances and shorthand for what was going on. And uh, you know, Deloitte just released a piece uh, on sort of the, their recommendations for top five practices for student success, and they highlighted that uh, one of those five needs to continue to be intentional outreach to first gen students. Uh, and they referenced that close to thirty percent of households with a first gen student canceled fall enrollment. Uh, last year. Wow. And so we, we, there are many folks who made it to our campuses who may still be questioning if they belong. And I think regards mm -hmm. to content, um, you belong might be the most important thing for us to communicate. And then some of our really, really important information. So uh, those are my, my initial thoughts on many, many, many different threads that I'm sure uh, we could go down. Ryan, I just wanted to jump in real quickly. I, I in the midst of, I think it was like, I don't know, June of 2020, I read this tweet and it, I, I wish I could be citing some brilliant piece of literature and I could, but this one struck me because it said, 
what people want is to be part of communities and they keep getting put in audiences and that's causing a great deal of pain. And I think when I hear you talk, it's, it's clicking for me what a critical tool the communication is and the channels of communication have been throughout the pandemic of making people move from being an audience and talked at to being in community and be communicating with. And so I just want to say, you know, kudos to, to all of our communication professionals and you representing them for being that bridge between, you know, for being that tool to change people from feeling like they're an audience to feeling they're like they're a part of a community. But that light bulb just went off when it, and that tweet was running around in my head when you mm -hmm. talked about how impactful those communications have been and the channels of communication have been. Yeah, I think that's brilliant um, because I think it was so tempting to just turn all of our student engagement tools into just cranking out information. And that's when students hit mute. And so, um, so to be able to still have a sense of humor, to still trust students with the keys to our accounts and to still be able to do some of those things that, you know, we want to keep people engaged and listening and not just reciting things. And that was, that's been such a tension point and, and well-deserved, right? If we have, you know, um, the director of county health saying, please send this tweet out about these instructions on how to get a vaccine. Um, and you've got, again, not only uh, your social media folks saying this still has to be engaging, but you've also got trolls and you've got people. I mean, at, at UCLA, we put out anything about vaccines on our social media and we immediately are inundated with with uh, folks who are trying to undermine the science. Right. So there are so many fronts of communications and, you know, good reminder, check in with your content moderators. Uh, it's a it's a tough job. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. I think that's that's brilliant. I, I, I need to uh, re I need to visit what you're referencing because that's such a great quote. Yeah, and I also think uh, about the way, at least at MSU, there's been a lot of attention paid towards tone too, and understanding that for 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 many of the folks in our population, the pandemic had a very disparate effect, right? So for some, it was, you know, we got to all hang out at home and do our laundry at our lunch hour. So whether staff or students, for others, it was, you know, a parent lost a, a job or a parent had. Um, had COVID, right? So like, what were the ways that we were using communications to kind of also um, indicate empathy? Uh, and I think that's a, that's a real challenge as well, because tone is hard to read in text, right? It's not necessarily as, as effusive as, as it is when you're talking to people in person. The other thing that I noted a lot of on our campus, at least, is that they created, um, virtual walking tours and actual physical walking tours you could do with QR codes, right? So you saw these people walking around scanning QR codes on the fronts of buildings. Um, so I think the resurgence of the QR code is one of the um, unique things that happened during the pandemic. We thought it was dead. It is not. Um, so Jennifer, I, I am curious about this idea of how the pandemic variations in 2020, 2021 um, might be felt. Um, and, you know, when our campus at least started thinking about orientation, uh, we, we did it through a process that we called reorientation. So reorientation was this, you know, this kind of dual purpose initiative where First year and so first year and second year students were all together, um, but there's all these other implications. So so some of those events, so some of those fall welcome events that we've talked about, right, were massive. At at, at a campus like MSU um, with the incoming cohort, you're just like, I can't imagine. And also people were like, this might be the first time I've been been in this big of an audience. Um, so can you talk a little bit about like? how those events might have shifted, what you've seen uh, across campuses that you've worked with or visited um, in terms of welcoming students, um, and then maybe some of the other repercussions that we might be facing in terms of retention persistence. Um, I'm really struck by Brian's point about first-gen students too. You keep on giving me these giant questions. <laughs> I keep on thinking really how am I going that. to answer this. Um, you know, there's so many things that I think have come out of this, and um, I don't even, I'm not even sure where to begin with this question, but I'm going to do my best. I, I think that what's interesting, though, is that I love conceptualizing 
the the students as you know the first year experience on the transitions as communities of practice and that's actually drawn i won't get too deep into the the literature that's drawn from a theory called legitimate peripheral participation which talks about how people enter into communities of practice and one of the reasons i think it's a really relevant one is that communities of practice are defined um, by kind of social systems and it can be places but doesn't have to be you know so that's also useful in this time when place is this ephemeral concept right it feels like it can be taken away from us at any kind of next variant or any kind of say other safety element but you know when i think initially we thought of the first year experience as a community of practice and then we thought of the second year experience the sophomore year experience as its own community of practice and what we're seeing right now is if it was a venn diagram those are overlapping a lot right mm. the, the the needs are very similar but like Laura said, we still want to honor the fact that these students that are second year students and coming back maybe for the first time on campus still went to class. I mean, they still had connections. They still, you know, hooked into our environments, maybe not in ways that they had thought or ways that historically, set, you know, first year students do, but they do. So it's, it's a delicate balance of how do you give them what they need in terms of what they're facing as a sophomore student, but also honor what they lost, right? You don't want to infantilize them and treat them just like, you know, one thing I keep on telling campuses is please don't pretend like you're, you know, don't, don't throw everybody in the same cohort. You know, you, you, there might be a great deal of overlap. You might be repeating it, but these are two different groups that may need different things. That said, some of the really exciting work coming out of like orientation and other first year practices had a lot to do with blurring those lines. Um, so, you know, welcome week programs, um, orientations, admissions events where you engage your upper, you know, your upper class students, your, your more senior students, either not just in peer leader roles, but this kind of rite of passage of the second year students handing over something in a very ceremonious mm. way to the first year students. That was really exciting things we saw coming out of that work even before the pandemic. And so there are kind of models of best practice where we, we really do draw these two groups together in meaningful ways. And we capitalize on the fact that that was a, a, a budding area of work and really use it to our benefit here where there might be a great deal of overlap and need, but by the same token, honoring the second year students who are kind of passing things on to those first year students. Because you have to remember, first year students, even though they're coming to campus in a ways that the second year students didn't get to, they might be coming to the campus, you know, they might have chosen that campus sight unseen. I mean, they had yeah. unique experiences. It's not like they're having the same experience a first year student did at that institution five years ago. There is difference. And the sophomores do have some kind of knowledge capital of how they navigated some of that in a COVID landscape. And they so they do have skills, not just of being a second year student of the institution, but having navigated one year of college in this somewhat crazy environment. So I do like the idea of, of blurring those lines and I liked it even before now. And I, now I see it as even being potentially even more of a promising practice. Um, I also have to say that one of the, the standards of, you know, kind of recommended practice has always been a constellation of support. The first year experience is no one program. It's not anybody's sole responsibility. I mean, if you have a director of the first year experience of student transitions, that's wonderful, but I, that person probably will tell you firsthand um, that they are relying upon collaborations and connections across mm. the campus. So we always say, you know, uh, it's great that you have an award-winning orientation program or that your first year seminar is written up in, you know, US News and World Report, but that's one star program. A true first year experience is a constellation of support and initiatives that goes across campus divides, across student affairs, across academic affairs, classroom, co-curriculum, on campus, off campus, community partners, you're really drawing everyone. And in this day and age, particularly I think in COVID, outside of your campus, because students have co-enrolled, they have you know, done dual enrollment in high school, they've been taking maybe classes at their local community college as well as at your institution. All those lines have blurred about a singular institutional experience. And so a, a, a true constellation of support and leveraging those connections is really, I think, a way to do it and including that um, as we welcome these new students because somebody who might be maybe have historically been more of a partner for second year students really is being brought into the whole constellation of support for first and second year students as they go through this. So I, I think that the lines were already being blurred and I'm excited to see how we're gonna continue to do that in this space um, and, and engage our sophomores. One of the biggest challenges though, I think is that one of the greatest pieces of the sophomore year experience is this transition from being a new member of the community to being a contributive member of, of community, either as a paraprofessional, a student leader, um, rising kind of to a, a position of 
uh, more responsibility in a particular campus activity or club or organization or at the institution or even an employment. And so many students didn't get that. And so we're seeing this um, lack, I guess, of initial training and a gap in students who are in a role that they have appropriate experiences or even the confidence to take on those student roles of leadership and engagement in that second year. So I think there might be a gap there that we're experiencing just in terms of capacity to run an institution when you think of all the student leaders you rely upon to serve and function as those first year programs and initiatives. So those are just some of the things. The only other thing I do wanna say is that we've talked all danced around this, but I do think that our institutions were faced with factors that we always knew in our students and their identities, but were not able to see and they were often hidden. And so the students could self disclose and those students were either forced to disclose those things or we were forced to face them. So we're running around campuses that are residential saying, we're going to make you safe and send you home. And there was a good contingent of students who said, uh, home is not safe, not safe, or I don't yeah. have a home, or if I go there, I don't have enough food to eat, or I don't have internet access. And so this idea of sort of competing needs and what means, what is safe and what does safe mean? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we were faced with students who, um, you know, issues of poverty, issues of food insecurity, housing insecurity, you know, domestic safety, Conceptualizations of conceptualizations of family, uh, first generation students trying to figure out like what what does this all mean? So we were and students with emotional and mental health care issues that were either triggered by this or mm -hmm. emerged from this. So a lot of those identities that often remain hidden until people want to come tell us, they had to tell us or we were faced with those. And I do think there's a real opportunity to normalize some of the things that maybe have historically been filled with shame, and maybe. They have been put out in the open, and in some ways, I do hope they stay in the open. One of those being mental and emotional health. You know, we all have lived through a collective trauma. We're all here trying to grow and support and heal. And us talking openly about mental and emotional health and well-being isn't just about serving our students; it's about serving ourselves. Yeah, Laura, I am really curious what your thoughts are on this and how um, how you at at Rutgers or your colleagues, as you've talked um, nationally within the Big Ten or elsewhere, have have really thought about, you know, the changes that will kind of forever be in place because of this pandemic, because of the variations um, to serving students during transition in 2020 and 2021. So yeah. what are your reactions? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think this, I think the pandemic has given us permission to uh, address some of the kind of challenges that we've always known that were there. So I'm um, kind of reimagining how do we uh, kind of uh, extend the arm to a variety of students. And so um, being able to step into the virtual world and not just be a talking head, but how do you find ways to engage uh, with, with our students before they even come to campus to continue that thread? Um, I, I think it's trying to see um, what were some of the positives that came out in terms of the ability to um, for students to be able to connect out connect one on one? We saw that in our advising um, uh, offices in terms of ability to have one on one advising appointments versus large groups because they would come to campus and just trying to think about capacity. Um, I also think just in terms of um, uh, really being able to pick the thread back up on our second year students. Um, we knew that that cliff was there, but I think this gave us an opportunity to uh, really pick it back up and say, okay, we recognize that you weren't part of the campus community, but this isn't just a one-off year. How do we make sure that we continue to support our, our second year students moving forward? Uh, so I think there's a lot of lessons that we are able to, to take from this and, and, and put into future programs. Um, how do we, begin to space out their learning. I, I know um, that Jennifer had talked about in terms of being able to cram a lot of information into that first year. And so in a virtual environment, you have to slim it down because um, a 30 minute in-person program doesn't land in the same way in a virtual environment. And so again, it's that intentionality and that permission to start thinking, what is it that students need to know? When do they need to know it? And what's the best, um, medium in which to serve that. Um, and so I think that's been a lot of the questions in terms of um, as we move forward, do we move into a hybrid approach in terms of mm -hmm. where there are some things that make sense to do online for a student to take at their own pace versus things that need to be in person. Um, so whether it's around connection or just ability to ask questions in real time um, to even being able to build on that. So I think there's a lot of conversation of uh, moving away from the one-offs. And how do you really look at the journey of our students um, and being able to tailor it to the student and not just a one size fits all, 
everyone comes to an orientation program, everyone goes to welcome week, all right, classes start. But how do you begin to create some nuances um, within those experiences to address those identities that we knew were there, but we didn't either didn't have the resources or the time or the opportunity to, to really be able to address. And so for me, I think that's the exciting part of um, being able to take this permission. We had to alter um, uh, kind of given the pandemic, but how do we continue to have that permission as we move forward um, in the work that we're, we have the opportunity to do? Yeah, on a, on a previous episode, um, we talked about this idea of what needs to um, be restored, right? Like, what do we go back to completely doing the exact same? Um, what needs to evolve slightly um, because we've learned some things and we can do it better if we just tweak these components? And then what needs to completely transform? Um, and I'm thinking about other social identities and demographics and, you know, we talked in the, the beginning, like what is a traditional student experience? I think the pandemic has also illuminated the fact that for some students, being able to attend meetings in a hybrid, um, in a hybrid forum or creating opportunities for students to go to go to class and also have their kids right and in, in their environment is really key. Um, Brian, can you talk a little bit about some of the social identity pieces that have shown up? You, you mentioned the piece about first gen mm -hmm. students um, and how when when we think about forward looking, um, which of those social identities and how might we adapt um, our services to best serve the needs of more students? Yeah, well, one of the things that I've been looking at um, nationally, uh, just because it, you know, it's sparked here, but it's you know, so many different universities and systems have different rules within them, right, as students with differences in, in abilities and how, you know, as you mentioned, a, a Zoom environment um, created some access uh, issues, but also opportunities. And as we now have folks, um, both students who have um, a legitimate uh, reason to go remote and also faculty to teach um, and how you're seeing just a, a variety of different approvals and rejections for faculty requests to teach in person uh, versus remote uh, or online or hybrid, whichever you know term fits in. Uh, and there's a it's it's not consistent across so many different places. And so I think that um, that that's one particular identity that could even cause folks to transfer or leave jobs and move to different states and and just sort of you know, move around to where there might be a better opportunity. Um, and then I also just think that, uh, you know, as we've referenced before, um, the mental health of students and the ability to, you know, go from zero to a thousand and ramp full throttle right back up into complete in-person. Some students are very ready, others are not. Uh, and I think as we start to parse through different subpopulations, um, I think that there's probably just, again, um, there's going to be a desire to just pull towards uh, some some one size fits all solutions. And I don't think we're going to be there. I would also say to students with dependence is a population that I, as mm -hmm. of three years ago, now sympathize with and empathize with and connect with a lot more now that I've become a dad. Um, and balancing family life, I think, for not, not only students, but also staff is yeah. going to be an incredibly important dynamic uh, as we've, you know, uh, for, for again, I, I was a campus that was, uh, you know, very, 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 very remote work environment for the entire, you know, for as long as you possibly could be. I know some campuses were in more in person sooner. Uh, and so it's a drastic change for a lot of folks. And I, I think those are a couple of things that come come to mind with your question. We are getting towards the end of our time and we definitely have things that we didn't get to. Um, so I'm just going to open it up before we get to final thoughts as like, what did we not get to that you all would like to mention at this point? We didn't talk about recommendations for professional preparation or, you know, all of these other things. Anything you want to pick up on? Okay, maybe we I would just say, all the things. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I would just say who's who's doing the work, right? And so student mm -hmm. affairs and higher ed is not immune to the uh, great resignation. And uh, there's many, many, many staff leaving their positions uh, and there's folks leaving other industries coming to ours and loving it, right? And so there's such, there's so many different, um, there's so many different things that I think factor into that. I think some of that was happening pre-pandemic and I think some of it is exacerbated now, but 
Uh, who are our staff? What is it that they do? Uh, how do we prepare them in graduate programs? Do you need a graduate program? All of these different things, right, I think are now on the table to discuss. Um, and every, not just student affairs practitioners, but we have students who are not connecting with maintenance staff and dining workers because there's shortages there too. And those are incredibly important people in the lives of many of our students. And so I think that's one thing you could spend an entire episode on. Yeah, most definitely. I think there are so many diversity, equity, and inclusion themes and elements to the pandemic that we scratched the surface on, but mm -hmm. could be its own episode or series of episodes uh, with respect to acknowledging and recognizing different populations and the identities of students um, to the fact that, you know, everybody experienced a pandemic, but we didn't experience equally, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. and depending on resource and privilege and identity and location and social location, all that was a very different experience and the healing process and the re-entry are very different based upon how you experience the pandemic. Not to mention some of the policy things that have changed, you know, going test optional can com may completely rewrite access and equity issues in higher education, um, but we don't know how yet, right? And it might introduce incredible opportunities, but uh, but it might also sort of reprivilege different groups. And it, there's just so many things. And, you know, even how also we, we rewrite the term of inclusion as we reconvene in spaces, um, in person and in, in-person spaces. I think the word inclusion is something we need to revisit about in a true sense of inclusion of, of whose voices are being heard, who who was left at the margins? Who do we have the opportunity to re-engage? And who do we make sure it doesn't fall out of the system? Um, mm -hmm. So I just feel like there's so many DEI uh, themes that, that we didn't get to and that are just so important to the work and the decisions we're making right now. Hey, for me, just really quickly, and we touched on it briefly, but the well-being aspect uh, in terms of, as we step into uh, kind of this new consistent way of learning, um, this new consistent way of engagement, being mindful of how, what toll that's taking on our students. Um, we're seeing students that are in-person classes, but also virtual classes, and the mental capacity that is required for that, um, but also just coping strategies of kind of leaving a pandemic in terms of the impact on self and, and family and their community um, to uh, how do they balance that with already existing uh, variety of roles. So I think the, the well-being piece is one that is it's on my mind and wondering as we step into this new consistent way, how do we prepare and address and support students? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been thinking as you all were talking to to pick up on the theme around DEI issues, you know, we and the well-being piece is that our students experience the COVID pandemic, but we're also experiencing racial justice pandemic, other issues of climate change and and the ways that those are affecting students because they participated in a in a um, in almost an audience of those things happening on our news feeds as well. And so what you know we could have a whole episode of like the ways student activism was affected by their their engagement or, or lack of engagement in um, in the Black Lives Matter movement during the summer, right? So like I'm thinking a little bit about that as well. Um, Okay, so we're going to move to final thoughts. Uh, we'll try to make these brief since we're running, all, always running out of time on Student Affairs Now. Um, love to know. So this uh, podcast is called Student Affairs Now. What are you thinking about troubling, um, kind of worrying on, uh, reading, what, whatever you'd like to share um, with our audience for now? Um, and Jennifer, do you want to start? Sure. I think the thing that's on my mind at the moment, I've said this in several different settings, but that um, I think crisis has multiple phases and we tend to forget that. You know, there's the initial phase where there's an outpouring of resources to just manage the catalyst. And then there's kind of a long stretch of managing uncertainty, which is all about resource conservation. And then there's the part about managing change. That is mm -hmm. in some ways the final cycle of crisis. And I do think sometimes we perseverate in managing crisis because we know how to do that better than we know how to manage change. And right now we're really on the on the cusp of the managing that change and deciding, like we've alluded to here, I think Laura said it most recently, like what do we want to keep from what we've done before? Yeah. What is meaningful? How do we mm -hmm. how do we say like, yeah, that worked and we want to engage that going forward? But also part of the managing change is healing right? That all of us going through some type of collective healing, which requires grace and forgiveness and engagement and, and the courage to interrogate our practices. 
Um, so I just, to me, that's what's on my mind is how do we collectively embrace this stage of the crisis cycle of really going, okay, now it's time to, to go through the healing and the change process. And how do we make sure we're not perseverating in crisis because that seems quote unquote easier because we, we have protocols for crisis. We have fewer protocols for change. And so that's where my mind's been. And I've been observing different people and how they embrace that, that phase of the crisis cycle. Oh my gosh, I love that. Um, as a campus currently in the midst of major organizational change, I think it has been a crisis for a long time. That's great. Um, Laura, final thoughts for you. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's wondering how we can embrace um, what we've been through in terms of the lessons learned, uh, but also not try and get to the new normal. Um, I think that's a phrase that um, we like to kind of coin, but for me, it's more so how do we get to a new consistency? Um, because I, 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 my fear is that the new normal will be kind of pre-pandemic. Um, and I, I think there are so many lessons that we've learned through the pandemic, um, whether it be through challenges, whether it be through accomplishments um, that are worth taking a critical eye to, to figure out how we move forward. Um, and my hope is that if we can kind of go to a consistency piece that can also make us be flexible and nimble should we face another change or another crisis or um, kind of another moment um, that requires us to pivot. So I'm hopeful um, and on my brain is wondering how do we embrace the lessons learned um, to inform how we move forward um, and in a way that allows us to be uh, flexible and adaptable. Thank you so much. Brian, final thoughts. Wow. Uh... I think a final thought I think is just with, you know, our, our, our core mission as universities to make sure that folks uh, who attend and come in leave better for it. Uh, and I think we, I think those of us who are on uh, programs like this and engage with students will very quickly fill that gap of the missing connection and the uh, finding community, but I think we also have to think about the value of a degree as the nation debates student loan forgiveness and things of that nature. Um, and I think that our, all of these different industries uh, that are clamoring for employees will probably start asking us, hey, are your students ready after three years? Can you, can we give them a job now? And mm. I think our students will say, hey, can I do online? I did online for two years. Why can't I go work full time and do my senior year online? I'm ready to go work for these places. And so I think that that will be one. And then I think also on the topic of financial wellness is that, um, you know, there's sort of a new component to financial wellness that wasn't as prevalent pre pandemic. And that's the emergence of gamified uh, great user experience online brokerage accounts where mm. college students can uh, throw their student loans into a stock and have access to options and margins. And um, I think that that's, you know, some of us, I remember signing up for a credit card in fall of 1996 and then putting my credit into a hole. And, uh, you know, there's folks in student affairs who work to reform some of those things, but there's nothing stopping a college student from signing up for one of these things with no financial literacy, incredibly powerful tools. Uh, and then I think, you know, continuing to educate our staff on ways in which students can can earn a living. Some of those salaries that were leaked on Twitch a couple of months ago, very, very high uh, running Twitch accounts. Uh, one person was making over $700,000 a month. And so there's a lot of things we can talk about in terms of finance with our students that I think is very important. Wow. I'm not going to let my kid know that number. <laughs> It'll make me very nervous. Did I say 700,000? I meant $7.25. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Very good. <laughs> Um, thank you all so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. the conversation was fantastic um, as we think about how we're ser best serving Froshmores, the two cohorts. Um, so also heartfelt appreciation to our dedicated behind the scenes uh, production assistant, Nat, you rock. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, if you are listening today to Student Affairs Now and not already receiving our newsletter, please visit our website studentaffairsnow.com and a pop-up should appear and you can enter your email to join our MailChimp list. And while you're there, check out our archives. We're at 67 or 10 or something, uh, something over 60 at this point episodes. Um, and if you found this conversation helpful, please share it on your social media platforms. Leave us a five-star review. We're gonna be launching a contest soon for folks who leave reviews. There may be swag involved, so please um, share with us how you are using this in your work. 
Um, finally, just another shout out to our sponsors. We really appreciate your support. So a little bit more about them. This episode was sponsored by Anthology. Transform your student experience and advance co-curricular learning with Anthology Engage. With this technology platform, you are able to easily manage student organizations, efficiently plan events, and truly understand student involvement to continuously improve your engagement efforts at your institution. Learn more by visiting anthology.com slash engage. And uh, this episode is also sponsored by EverFi. For over 20 years, EverFi has been the trusted partner of over 1,500 colleges and universities. With nine efficacy studies behind their courses, you will have confidence that you are using the standard of care for student safety and well being with the results to prove it. Transform the future of your institution and the community you serve. Learn more at everfi.com slash student affairs now. Um, if you go to our website, you can also learn more about our other sponsors. Um, again, I am Heather Shea. Thanks for our listeners and to everyone who's watching and listening and serving on our panel today. Um, go out and make it count, everyone. Thank you.